Moral relativism, or more precisely, meta-ethical moral relativism, is a position that the truth or falsity of moral judgments, or their justification, is not absolute or universal, but is relative to the traditions, convictions, or practices of a group of persons. Let us listen to a brief defense of meta-ethical moral relativism given by a professor questioning Noam Chomsky on the matter. In this way, we will get acquainted to the topic we will be discussing, and will have an example for the subsequent analysis. Forty years ago, you had a tele televised debate on the Dutch TV with Michel Foucault, probably the most influential contemporary French intellectual. You said that you had never met anybody so amoral, and indeed, he is widely viewed as the main defender of postmodernism and moral relativism. But what is wrong with that? Don't you see that ethical norms vary widely across space and time? Slavery, subjugation of women, repression of homosexuals have been accepted in many cultures and still are. Here, it is a scandal to make caricatures of the Holocaust, but it is considered admirable to make caricatures of the prophet. In Iran, it's the other way around. The terrorists of the Israelis are the freedom fighters of the Palestinians. Muslims think that their religion is truly universal, and Christians think likewise, but for their religion, while well, secularists think secularism is the only solution. Isn't truth itself, including scientific truth, always the effect of regimes of truth, as Foucault called them, that are inextricably linked to power? Isn't there something, both parochial and imperialist, in asserting one's own value system as being, quote, truly universal, unquote? Before answering directly to the moral relativist, let us observe some of the prototypical building blocks an argument for moral relativism is made of. Very often we find a descriptive statement regarding our observation of morality as it presents itself in the real world. In particular, the moral relativist notices that, as a matter of empirical fact, there are deep and widespread moral disagreements across different societies and times. In this case, we're given the examples of slavery, the subjugation of women, and the repression of homosexuality. The moral relativist claims that these disagreements are significant, and we can't coherently make sense of them. The observation he is making is canonically named descriptive moral relativism. To distinguish it from the different meta-ethical position the moral relativist is trying to reach. After having established descriptive moral relativism, the moral relativist then uses it as a premise to construct an argument with the goal of establishing meta-ethical moral relativism. In fact, it is not directly obvious that if descriptive moral relativism is true, that then meta-ethical moral relativism will immediately follow. If there is widespread disagreement on a matter, it does not mean that there is no truth to the matter. So the meta-ethical moral relativist has still some work to do to logically infer his position. The journey to reach meta-ethical moral relativism from descriptive relativism is perilous. Due to the hard task laid in front of him, challenges to the moral relativist's position, often given by attacking the specific reasoning that varies from philosopher to philosopher, that leads one to infer meta-ethical moral relativism from descriptive moral relativism. In this video, instead, we wish to provide a refutation to the moral relativist that does not go after his journey from A to B. Rather, we wish to directly attack his first premise, descriptive moral relativism itself. At first glance, this might seem like a foolish plan. Of course, descriptive moral relativism is true. We know that different cultures have very different ideas of what is morally acceptable or not. How can we possibly count up this point? Well, denying that there is a certain variance in customs between times and cultures is definitely off the table. But what if we were to find a coherent logic that ties different observed moralities together? If we could show that there is an underlying common structure to morality across time and space that allows for a certain degree of variability, then descriptive relativism would be considerably weakened. In particular, the argument for meta-ethical moral relativism would lose its strength, since one could then appeal to the common structure every culture shares as a justification for moral beliefs, and as a way to solve moral disagreements. This approach to confute the moral relativist is nothing new. 
many have made similar points. Indeed, if one thinks about it, descriptive relativism is quite a weird claim, akin to some kind of human exceptionalism. We find all sorts of structures in emergent behaviours of living organisms. Wouldn't it be quite peculiar if an emergent group behaviour of humans formed in a truly unstructured, unpredictable, chaotic fashion? Ironically, in this way, the descriptive moral relativist may end up appearing aligned with a religious believer that thinks that humans are somehow unique and have special features. In what follows, we will provide a possible structure linking moral norms through time and space. The viewer should keep in mind that we really don't have a scientific consensus on these matters yet, although they are currently being seriously investigated. If sometimes we end up talking in a matter-of-fact way, it's just for the sake of argument. Let's get going. The moral relativist immediately challenges us with a monumental point, slavery. What is the underlying common structure that connects the acceptance of slavery for most of human history to our modern recognition of its immorality? To understand this, we must make an honest effort of imagining ourselves about 11,000 years ago, living our precarious existence in a cave with other humans and think how different our answer to moral questions would be. Say for example a member of our group was misbehaving. Let's suppose he was killing the young, or constantly hurting other members of our group. How should we act? 11,000 years ago there were no policemen to call, no legal system, no prison, no knowledge of rehabilitation practices. We could try to make the subject more aware of the suffering he is causing, or try to discipline him in other ways. But what if he persists? At some point, some groups could recognise that they would be happier with that type of individual gone, and they might collectively decide to exile him or kill him. At those times, the two options were essentially equivalent. Alternatively, some primitive communities could come up with another solution. What if we had other people keeping an eye on the problematic individual practically 24-7? That would make him engage in useful activities for the other members of the group, of course under the implicit threat of violence. In this way, the life of a problematic individual could be spared, plus he could make himself useful. Maybe this could be a better solution. And just like that, we have created a primordial form of slavery. The point of this overly simplistic story is to show what it is possible humans thought that at the time of its creation, the institution of slavery made the society function better overall. They thought it could increase the average well-being of the tribe. Once the norm was adopted, then, with the passing of time, it could spread to other areas of society, become inscribed in the first written laws and in sacred texts, where other justifications aimed at convincing the population could be made as to why it was a good norm, eventually leading to its widespread normalisation and acceptance. Take the words of Aristotle, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. For the hours of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. Because of a very different information about reality the ancients had, there was no knowledge of DNA, evolution, etc. Even intellectuals of the time could have thought that the practice of slavery was a net positive, apparently sometimes even for the slaves themselves, that were somehow born different. Of course this is all nonsense, but what is important for our argument presently is that our ancient ancestors didn't originally support slavery because they thought that slavery was good in itself. They thought that slavery had an instrumental value in creating a happier society. Whether they were right or wrong given their environmental constraints is not the question at hand right now. What we are getting at is that there could have been a deeper reason to accept slavery, and the original reason we claim was the perceived well-being of society at large. Thinking about the very initial environment where a first version of the norm was adopted, this doesn't seem that hard to imagine. But why did the norm persist for so long, when at a certain point it clearly wasn't serving collective happiness anymore? To explain this we can take a look at some modern research on norm dynamics. The birth of a norm is often facilitated by a norm entrepreneur, that develops the initial idea the norm is based on and tries to convince others to adopt it. If others are persuaded, then there is a cascading effect where the rule can spread at an exponential pace and become a societal norm. For the cascading effect to happen, there must be a mutual interaction between individuals, where the goodness of the norm is discussed. 
This in some sense could presuppose a shared way to understand goodness. After widespread adoption, with a passion of time, the norm gets ingrained in our habits as humans. And at this point it often gets confused with morality itself. Breaking the norm may be considered immoral even if one can't explain why. A phenomenon named moral dumbfounding. Being creatures of habit, we built a desire to defend the norm, creating a post-rationalization phase that is signaled by the creation of ad hoc arguments to justify the norm and fallacious appeals to authority. For instance, other than showcasing the very different scientific knowledge the ancient Greeks had, the words of Aristotle we cited before may also be seen as a kind of mild, initial post-rationalization of the slavery norm. In that unknown facts about reality at the time are selected to accommodate the norm as much as possible. Reality is bended a bit to justify our habits. Needless to say, the internalization phase can be particularly long-lasting and troublesome. Subsequently, with the passing of time, with increases in knowledge and technological advancements, there is a realization that the ad hoc arguments are based on erroneous descriptive facts or facts that have changed. So the norm is re-evaluated once more against what we are claiming is the yardstick of collective well-being. In the case of slavery, even if the norm had produced any happiness in the first place, it certainly had overstayed its welcome, as tends to happen to ingrained societal practices. Okay, maybe, but what about the other examples of a moral relativist? Slavery, subjugation of women, repression of homosexuals. Let's go in order. Again, to understand the role of women in society, we can give a remarkably similar explanation as before. First, we go back to when a primordial version of the norm was initially adopted. We are in the order of hundreds of thousands of years in the past. Then we notice the environment in which the norm was first created. Observing that, the first sexual division of labor could have been established to divide tasks necessary for survival and prosperity. The male, who is better physically equipped to catch prey or gather other food, could focus more on resource gathering and the female could emphasize more on parental investment. Thus, the primordial norm is born in what is thought to be the service of well-being. Then, with the passing of time, stories get told about why the norm is good. It gets intermingled with religious arguments and post-rationalized by them, until it reaches the present day, where given our modern environment, it's easier for us to notice that the norm is not serving overall happiness anymore. So we abandon it. Indeed, forcing the role of a woman as primarily a caretaker forgoes all the utility she could bring to society, her family and herself, in other roles she might be more equipped or willing to conduct. It's not by chance or by regimes of power that we now consider forcing gender roles to be immoral. It's because, thanks to the voice of many women, we rationally questioned the norm and found it lacking. Not that conductive to forming a fruitful, happy society anymore. Repression of homosexuals. About 3,000 years ago, rules regarding the repression of homosexuality were written in Leviticus and in the Middle Assyrian Law Codes. As for other forms of sexual repression, they were linked to ascetic tendencies that took hold especially in communities that experienced great collective suffering. The idea was that the world was a place of great anguish and pain, and that any material bodily pleasure would just function as a way to keep one attached to a cruel reality. A trade that wasn't worth it. The avoidance of the suffering could only be obtained by renunciation of the world and oneself. Because of these arguments and others, like the fact that the ancients could not cure STDs like we can today, norms repressing sexual acts took hold with the idea of increasing collective well-being. Homosexuality in particular was sometimes considered a disease which could be passed down from generation to generation, so it was especially targeted. With their scarce information, once again we see how the ancients could have thought that norms repressing sexual behavior might have turned out to be a net positive for society. As in the other cases, many things changed thanks to our scientific progress, and we can now clearly see that the repression of homosexuality creates suffering with no overall benefit. But the moral relativist is not finished. Here, it is a scandal to make caricatures of the Holocaust, but it is considered admirable to make caricatures of the Prophet. In Iran, it's the other way around. 
In the West, it is scandalous to make caricatures of a holocaust, because Westerners are afraid of trivializing the matter, in a way that could lead to its repetition. The event is correctly regarded as having brought tremendous amounts of suffering, caution is needed to not repeat the mistakes of the past. While caricatures of Muhammad are allowed because the great majority of people do not believe in the Muslim faith, and most people also hold the belief that freedom of expression, freedom to criticize, is an important ingredient for a happy society. In Iran it's the other way around because most of its population is Muslim. Thus, many believe that by depicting the Prophet they could go against the wills of their god, as recounted in some supplemental hadiths that explicitly ban drawings of living creatures. Going against an almighty god that can punish one with eternal suffering does not seem like a wise approach to maximize happiness. Instead, caricatures of the Holocaust are accepted in Iran because the government had an active role in denying the Holocaust, so a part of the population does not believe it really happened. Without getting into the geopolitical reasons that allowed such a conspiracy theory to fester, it's clear that if you believe that there is a Jewish conspiracy where evil people want to take over the world, and that they have essentially faked the Holocaust, you would be helping the collective well-being by calling them out. These disagreements are disagreements on facts, that imply different moral choices. But the underlying reason for the different moral choices is still the same in both cases. The same idea of goodness can be applied in very different ways depending on the environments different actors operate in. The moral relativist correctly identifies that there is a great variability in what is considered moral, but incorrectly assumes that there is no rhyme or reason to these disagreements. When we ponder the matters carefully, we see that there is an essence to human morality, collective well-being, that practically all cultural norms can be reduced down to. In other words, we could say that descriptive relativism is limited around a trend. When one acknowledges this fact, it is much more tempting to identify with an objective morality the underlying common essence around which moral norms form. But maybe one is still unconvinced about our empirical account of morality. One thing to keep in mind is that when a moral relativist describes descriptive moral relativism, he cites examples that to our modern gaze are the hardest to link back to collective well-being, because he is trying to convince us that we can't make any sense of how moral norms vary. But the overwhelming majority of cultural norms can easily be linked back to the service of collective happiness, as we have remarked in previous videos, and many of the norms we adopt are shared throughout different societies. Also, if we vary our moral norms in a truly unbounded manner, with no rhyme or reason to it, why do punishments for crimes become milder and milder throughout time for practically all cultures? Why do we now recognize that slavery, repression of homosexuality, and the subjugation of women are wrong? Quite a coincidence that we update our norms towards happier societies if cultural rules were only due to regimes of truth linked to power. Finally, if descriptive moral relativism was true, and cultural norms could vary essentially arbitrarily, why have no practices with the explicit aim of increasing suffering took hold? For example, why don't we torture some random subsection of a population to death at 20 years of age? Why don't we blind uh, all those born in October, just for the sake of it? It's not imperialistic or baroque to recognize that there could be a fundamental common reason that links all moral norms together. If, as we believe, what we are claiming is true, then we possess a common currency, our collective well-being, with which to evaluate norms upon. Realizing this, then, there is an empirical fact of a matter to which norms increase our collective well-being more than others. This truth may be more or less easy to discover, but it is there. As Joshua Greeney points out in his outstanding book Moral Tribes, utilitarianism is a meta-morality a higher level moral system that adjudicates among competing tribal individual moralities. Utilitarianism does not require us to march behind anyone who claims to be serving the greater good. Instead, it asks us to make decisions in ways that are likely to lead to good outcomes, taking into account the limitations and biases inherent in our natures. And given the history of utopian politics, utilitarianism requires us to be skeptical of leaders who claim to have the greater good all worked out. In sum, utilitarianism combines the golden rules in partiality with the common currency of human experience. This yields a moral system that can acknowledge moral trade-offs and adjudicate among them, and it can do so in a way that makes sense to members of all tribes.